All right, welcome back, everybody. This is Mike Badger with another episode of Pasture Poultry Talk. This is episode number 48. And today I'm going to be joined by Pat McNiff from Pat's Pasture in East Greenwich, Rhode Island. Uh, Pat runs a diversified farm up there, uh, focusing on, well, not necessarily focusing, but raising broilers, ducks, layers, turkeys, and uh, a few other things that will give him a chance to tell us about. And he's also an APA board member uh, as of uh, just, you know, early to mid 2016. So he's right at the start of those responsibilities. And uh, <laughs> Pat, welcome. Welcome to the show. And why don't you go ahead and just uh, fill in some gaps there for me and let us know kind of kind of what Pat's pasture is all about and uh, maybe something to give us a glimpse of who who Pat is. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, Mike. Thanks for having me on, and it's uh, great to be on the podcast. I listen to it often and, and love APA. You guys are, you know, I guess me too now. I'm on the board, but it's, <laughs> That's a, right. it's, a, it's, <laughs> it's a great organization. I'm really, really happy to be involved. But um, So, yeah, a little bit about myself, uh, my farm. Um, so, we are located in uh, Rhode Island, the uh, the biggest little state in the Union. And, um, and like we, we like to say, we're 3% larger during low tide uh, in Rhode Island. So... <laughs> Um, you know, we, we are a very small state and oftentimes I get a lot of questions from people about how, um, you know, is, is there actually farms still left in our state? And we, we do, we, we, we don't have many, but we do have, we do, they're also mighty as well. We have a lot of mighty small and, uh, farms too. And we farm about, um, we farm about, um, around a hundred acres of leased land. So we don't, we don't own actually in our land. Um, we lease our main farm from a community land trust. And then we have two other farm sites uh, where we raise uh, a lot of different animals. And uh, since, you know, you asked me kind of for the numbers of everything, we, we raise on kind of on pasture about 11,000 broilers a year. Um, and we have our own mobile processing unit uh, as well as a USDA plant we use too up in uh, Johnston, another part of the state. We raise about 600 turkeys and uh, we have about 1,800 laying hens, uh, 250 ducks. 150 uh, meat ducks were kind of more of an experimental project and about 50 quail, also an experiment. I'll let you know how those go. Um, <laughs> and then uh, we also do, uh, we raise about 250 hogs on pasture and, and about 30 head of beef. Plus we have five guardian dogs to make sure everyone stays safe and alive and everything else uh, here on the farm. And for a little while we actually raised guardian dogs as an enterprise too. We we're kind of more settled on just keeping what we have right now. Um, I see. And, and, uh, yeah, so, and we also, so we sell all our products kind of in state, you know, one of the best parts about being in a little, little state is we're very close to a lot of our markets. So we're uh, half an hour from Providence or a couple hours from Boston or three hours from New York city. Um, so one of the best parts about being where we are is mar- access to markets is really great. So that allows us to kind of market our products really well. Um, and, and the, kind of the other part of what we do too, is we also have a food truck and a, a food cart where we sell our products at farmers markets and that we actually cook all that we prepare and do kind of a uh, farm to fork food truck. We have a farm to fork food truck and cart and stuff. And so we, we do our specialty is breakfast sandwiches because we have great eggs and amazing bacon and sausage and everything else. So that's just a, another part of our enterprise as well as all the, our retail and wholesale farm products. Yeah, that, that's awesome. So that's, uh, that's quite a bit going on. And, and just to put the, the emphasis on it then. So you've just described what is for you a full-time uh, farm basically, right? And and you have, That's right. and you have labor, you have employees working for you. We do. Yeah. So it, it's a full-time operation. Um, and uh, it's, it kind of, it's not a family farm but from the, like I didn't inherit it. We, it was started kind of, um, I'm actually from the, the mean streets of suburban Long Island originally. <laughs> and uh I grew up with uh, livestock being like a cocker spaniel poodle and uh, a <laughs> couple couple uh, hamsters. So I didn't really grow up with livestock. Um, we had some impatience in the yard. I actually came into agriculture kind of um, actually from community development work. Um, I was a vegetable farmer, an organic vegetable farmer for years, and then got into livestock. So, um, so yeah. So I don't, I don't come from that kind of farming background. Hence why I lease all my land and don't own anything. But um, I, I have I have uh, employees on the farm here. Um, we have a livestock manager here who's actually a former, uh, he was a, uh, a apprentice at one of the Polyface rental farms. Um, and he's an amazing asset to our farm. I couldn't, I couldn't do it without him. And then we have, uh, we have about five, 
uh, full-time staff year-round, and then we have about, you know, part-time here and there. We have, as of to being about 10, plus we do a thing called WorkShare program where people can volunteer and they get a uh, part. We, we have a meat CSA on farm, and they can get a meat CSA by volunteering their time on farm, doing mm-hmm. every kind of task around, too. So um, nice. that kind of helps expand our labor without expanding our, our uh, kind of uh, payroll right. as well. Right. Yeah, that's great. I, I remember one of the last times we talked for an article, Pat, we talked about uh, your, your laying ducks and, and uh, which was a fascinating uh, conversation, you know, and you, you got 250 of those now, but I'm, I'm, we'll, we'll find out how happy you are to, to have those 150 meat ducks <laughs> on, <laughs> on farm when you finally uh, take them to market. Yeah. But, but uh, that's, yeah. that's exciting to see you trying some new things in the quail. I'll be interested to see how that pans out. Um, yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> That's, uh... I, I'm a, I, I'm a little bit. But my energy is I always want to try. You know, I, I I like to do new things too, and I think that keeps it interesting and fun. And so I'm always like doing a little. The ducks, the laying ducks were experiment years ago that was successful. So, but uh, the meat ducks are perpetual experiment that I just um uh, I don't know <laughs> a glutton for punishment. I guess I'm not sure. <laughs> I want to talk about some of the the I guess the economics of the of the farm. Not necessarily in terms of dollars, but um, in, in specific terms. But how do you use pastured poultry to bring, you know, the revenue into the farm, and and how does that fit into kind of what what's happening overall with your farm profits? You 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 tend to, by my read, be pretty heavily slanted to the broiler, or I'm sorry, to the um, poultry generally. So yeah, can you just talk a little bit about those that that relationship? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, you know, <laughs> the pol- I, I started out with poultry kind of, you know, obviously it's the easiest thing to kind of get into when you're a vegetable farmer, too, because you can kind of have them on the side of the, the fields and stuff. And so I kind of moved that way. And, and obviously, you know, everyone will tell you it's that, that quick turnaround in terms of, you know, cash flow and everything else and return on investment. So, um, you know, the, the way we look at kind of all the different pieces of, pro- you know, revenue on our farm is how do we kind of keep cash flow moving on the farm and, and how do we have multiple income streams to kind of keep cash flow um, working on our farm and, you know, turning inventory into, 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 you know, profits. So, um, so the, the, you know, the, the poultry kind of really fit that niche and that they're that quick turnover, they're providing us, you know, with, with egg is a really short turnaround time. Right. Um, with with the broilers, you know that very close turnaround time, and then with turkeys, uh, you know a revenue, a larger revenue source coming in right before the winter when you know some of our profits are at their lower point uh, throughout the year. So um, I think it, it's definitely that cash flow that helps. You know, with our hogs, you know we're talking six to eight months coming out of hog. With our beef, we're talking two years right. for grass fed beef, and so you know those windows are you know they're they feel bigger at the time when we sell, we sell those kind of products, but, um, you know, they, the chicken is kind of, people are just, people eat a lot of chicken as you know. Right. And, uh, so it just provides that extra, that, um, cash flow that we need, uh, on a weekly and monthly basis. So, um, awesome. and, and I should, and I don't know where this will fit in if it does, but to, you know, the other side of some of our things like our layers and that we've kind of created, um, relationships that allow us not to raise chicks and stuff like that. I don't know if that'll fit in somewhere later, but um, that that provides us a quicker turnaround in terms of income for like eggs and that. So, so basically, you're describing ready to lay pullets. So they come to you 16, 17 weeks of age, and and they're laying within one to two weeks, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And we we kind of I've over the years built this kind of growers group, and we contract with a local, you know, with a hatchery down in Pennsylvania. We um, we buy in like this year we bought in twelve thousand broilers for the the spring and we'll buy about three thousand broilers in the fall and then divvy them up amongst farmers and it allows us to keep the price lower and group ship and everything like that and which makes eggs much more profitable for us rather than raising chick you know going from you know chick to you know starting pullet and stuff like that so yeah um, when I talk about that quicker cash flow sometimes people think that isn't the case with layers because you're raising them for all those months. And we kind of see them. Um, actually the layers we get a start of pullets, not only do we get them at a lower rate, then we're selling them back. at pretty much the same rate we bought them for is either spent hens or, um, or we're selling them to our local slaughterhouse, you know, poultry slaughterhouse or whatever. So, um, 
that that's where we get that quick turnaround in cash with eggs. Yeah, and I just want to yeah. I just want to clarify something, Pat. When you just to make sure I heard it right, or sure. we do clarify. You said you bring up twelve thousand. You said broilers. In the oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I meant uh, pull, yeah. Sorry, um, they're um, pullets, ready to lay pullets. Like a, okay, that's too many too <laughs> many chickens to talk about. Man. Too many chickens to talk about. Just wanted to get make sure yeah. we, we had that. That's what has been kind of your worst pastured poultry moment that you've experienced to date that you would like to share with us? I think, you know, one of the, the things, uh, is, I mean, most farmers will probably tell you is always about weather and storms and stuff like that. We, we've, uh, we've, you know, we're coastal and my first farm that I leased was right on the water. And, um, I remember, you know, one of our seasons where we had this freak, uh, snow, hail storm in October and high, high winds and, um, I mean, I think everyone's worst day is when they come out and see, you know, chickens getting, no matter what you do, getting killed or hurt or whatever. And, and that was probably one of my worst experiences. And, you know, just, you know, teaching when I was a younger farmer, teaching me to kind of just be <laughs> vigilant and over prepared and over, um, you know, just over prepared for bad weather and things to go wrong and probably not sleeping those nights when the weather is bad. So, um, that was probably my worst experience. We, we lost a lot of chickens and just the, the sadness of losing those chickens and it was terrible and just being, you know, entrusted with our lives and losing them plus, plus the income and plus this, it was, just, it was the most disheartening thing ever. So, um, yeah. but I think every poultry farmer probably has those experiences. I think that's, <laughs> yeah, that's probably one of the worst. That's that. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you, it's not only that you, you've lost that, that life to the weather, like you say, and the, there's a, events but it's also the downstream money like then you you miss all of those milestones from from the time when that chicken was supposed to be alive until you was planned to slaughter it um yeah and what would you say is your biggest weakness as a producer um i mean i think you know kind of our our access to markets here um is great but when you have access to markets you have high real estate values and in our area, I mean, our land is probably in the top three of the highest price per acre in the c- country. You know, we're the ocean state. We a lot of people like to vacation here. We a lot of kind of the the major land has kind of been eaten up by development and that. So finding good quality land and and kind of um, having long term leases and and also getting landowners to understand what it means to to have a farm and. Um, that, you know, how important it is to keep it as a farm is really important. So affordable farmland is probably our biggest weakness. And for me in our state, um, I, I'm on land trust land and I have a long term lease here, but, you know, we don't have it. We could use, you know, we could use another hundred acres or plus, um, and, and we could grow into it for sure. Um, so that's a big one. And the other one is labor. I mean, you know, we, we have some great labor right now. Um, but it's always a struggle, um, just to find good labor. Uh, you know, I know right. a lot of people think that not many jobs out there, you know, we're, we pay pretty well and, just finding really good folks who 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 have some skills, even not farming, but just kind of outdoor, like like being outdoors, like sweating, lifting heavy things. It, it, they can be hard to find. Right. Um, I've been I've been lucky this year. I've got some great folks, but uh, but that can be a real weakness in our operation too, because there's a lot of people, a lot of jobs competing for the same pool of people. So yeah. Um, now now the yeah. land that you're you're leasing right now was that farmland previously, or was that some kind of other? use yeah so the land trust has acquired it and it's kind of like quintessential quintessential new england farms are kind of these broken up paddocks we don't have a vast kind of acreage of land open without right. trees and whatnot and we our fields are kind of you know acreage five acres three five acres four acres fields interspersed with trees and woods which is great for us raising pigs in those but not so great for moving equipment and shelters in that so um it was farmed but you know it was like a traditional New England farm where it was at one point it had every animal under the sun. They milked cows, they raised some vegetables, they, you know, did fiber and everything else. Um, and then it kind of fell to kind of a, a local teacher in town actually bought it and used to work on it. Um, and then the town bought it when he was ready to sell. And, um, they had a real interest in keeping it in, um, in production and, and, and as a working farm. So it's, uh, it's kind of a rare thing in our state at least. Um, that it stays in working agriculture and, and is encouraged. So that, that's really great, and we're we're real lucky to have that. But um, there's not there's not a lot of that land in this area like that. I'm gonna actually keep moving right along then. And what, and what is your biggest strength? Would you say when it comes to to producing pastured poultry? 
Um, I mean, I think I kind of touched on a little bit, like we, we have a great, um, uh, strong market locally. And, um, and again, having great help, I, you know, I have a great right hand man kind of to help me having good staff. Um, and, um, you know, uh, those, those are two of our biggest strengths right now, I think. And, um, uh, and, you know, and also for me personally, it's like, uh, the vision for the market, you know, um, a bunch of years back, we, I invested a lot of money in building a mold processing unit, and scrimped and saved and built this thing. And, and if I hadn't done that, we wouldn't have, we were kind of first to the market in terms of pasture poultry in the state. And I think uh, you kind of have to see the, see what's ahead of you a little bit. And yeah. kind of saw that coming and, uh, and, and spent that money on, on that mobile processing unit and, you know, before they were really around much. And, uh, and it was, uh, it was a great investment. So yeah. I think seeing some of that. So basically, at some point, you saw you saw the risk. You you saw an opportunity, and you didn't know necessarily if it was going to be there, but you took the risk. And and uh, looking back now, it was a very very sound one. Yeah, yeah. Away. I mean, I, it definitely. I mean, we could, right now we have a USDA plant that opened about a year and a half ago in our state, but before that, there was nothing in the Northeast. And um, but there was this great demand for it, and uh, so building that MPU and had to had to strong arm our health department to accept it. But once we did, we, we were able to kind of really grow that business, kind of skyrocket the business um, and, and, and take control of the whole product. That's, that's been a huge thing. Like everything from we, we feed our dogs a raw diet. And so all the dog food for our dogs comes from our chicken operation. Um, and then we sell every bit of that chicken except for the feathers and the, the intestines. I mean, everything is, is being sold. So that that control really allows us to kind of maximize our profitability. Yeah. And this, you know, we've, I don't know if we've, uh, we've covered this next one or not, but we'll, we'll see. So what's been the most valuable innovation or improvement that you've had in your business to date? Uh, I think we got a couple. Um, uh, one of them, we, we kind of, our original houses for our poultry were kind of the EMT conduit kind of small houses. Okay. Um, they were, you know, 12 by eight, I believe they are a little smaller, so, but yeah, 12 by eight. and, uh, we've moved in the last few years to a larger style house. Um, kind of not as big as the mobile range coops kind of out there or the schooners because we just, because of our small fields, we have to be smaller. So ours are about 20 by, by, um, 12 and 20 by 16, but, um, okay. it has just really saved us in so much labor and time and, and, you know, you know, it, it, it's going to a larger house has been great. Um, so can't say enough good things about it. And what we do with those large houses too is, and we in the wintertime stick them together end to end and make our winter hoop houses because in the Northeast it's cold and snowy up here. And um, it allows us to have a, you know, the, the idea is that you don't have an asset that's sitting in the hedgerow for half your, you know, <laughs> right. four or five months out of the year. It's, it's being utilized all the time. So you can really utilize all that capital investment and and that has been great we it's our little like transformer it transforms from a mobile broiler shelter to a winter hoop house shelter and um that's really helped us a lot we're still working out the kinks it's not a perfect system but we really like it um and uh it, 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 it's, it's an exciting kind of thing and we uh, i guess that and um you know one of our things on the horizon we're trying to work on is actually doing more of these um center rollout nesting boxes with the you know that are automatic to, so our makes our egg collection a little faster. So that's our new innovation. We're kind of trying to, um, toy with a little more, um, that I hope that will save us a lot of time and energy as well. What's the one piece of information that you know now that you wish you would have known when you started? Um, you know, um, that's a tough question um, to, to, I, I mean, I think the one thing, you know, I keep on coming back to about why I've been successful, again, not growing up with this and not knowing what I should be doing, kind of starting from scratch. I think sometimes that's a gift in that I don't have preconceived notions on how things should be. Um, and I, I, you know, I guess, you know, what I wish I knew, I, I think it's the biggest one is the humility of being able to ask lots of questions and um, and you know, I didn't do this by going, I wasn't an apprentice anywhere. I didn't apprentice. I kind of just jumped right in both feet. Um, mm-hmm. so, you know, uh, I, I think I wish I, I wish I had worked on another farm in some ways. I think that would have been a great thing to do. 
Um, I always say to my apprentices and people who work here, it's always better to learn off of somebody else's dime um, because right. <laughs> save yourself, <laughs> sell yourself a lot of money. And um, maybe I should have maybe done that when I started out. Um, but also to kind of have some humility when you start out too and, um, and be able to look at poultry operations that are maybe not what you would do or, uh, and, uh, and, um, and learn from those people. Cause there's a lot, and they, and a lot of people want to give, even though they may, you know, they might think you're a little crazy to raise your birds outside on pasture. Um, I think there's just so much to learn from others. And if you just kind of be humble and be open to asking lots of questions, um, I, I'm the guy at the conferences that asks a thousand questions and the presenters usually say, Oh, you're the guy who asks all the questions. And, <laughs> and, uh, and I, and I think it's, and they appreciate, I mean, I, as a presenter myself, I appreciate being asked questions because it challenges the way I think about things, but right. um, I think it's the way you learn. And I think that humility is really important when you start out. I see a lot of folks starting out in this and they're just, they, they, they've read a couple of books and they've done it a few ways. And, you know, we're, we're always um, doing different iterations of how we do our work and, and that's okay. And I think that which it also makes it interesting. Got just a few more things to go here. We're going to some quick answers, some quick questions, some quick answers. And then uh, thinking back, you know, to, to when you started your pasture poultry business, was there something that was holding you back from starting it that, that gave you a little bit of a pause before you jumped in? Um, I mean, I think the kind of the processing part was for us back then was the hardest part of it. And it's, uh, you know, we, we had no, I remember actually processing with the folks who we now, who now have a USDA plant under exemption. We were, we were kind of selling them with a wink, 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 nudge, nudge, um, kind of thing. And, um, you know, processing and, and then just having regulations that allowed us to sell at farmers markets, the health department in our state wouldn't let us sell at farmers markets. And that, that held us back. It just, it was the only, you know, we could raise as many chickens, you know, chickens as we want, but we just didn't have the regs or the processing ability. So that was that was a real big barrier to getting the product to market. Yeah, gotcha. And, and that's a, that's a strong one, by the way. Um, yeah, so yeah. We've uh, so we've all received some advice along our along the way from 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 people. So what what's the best advice that you've been given that you draw on? Uh, I think back to what I just said a little while ago is always be willing to ask questions and humble yourself to people around you and not think, you know, kind of everything. I think, um, I think, you know, if, even if you don't agree with the way someone raises something or whatever, it, there's just so much wisdom out there. And, and we, you put yourself at such a deficit if you don't open yourself up to that wisdom. And I think that's, uh, you know, I love asking questions. I love being inquisitive. I learned that from an old farmer of mine who's a very successful organic vegetable farmer. And he would ask questions and I, I kind of even knew he knew the answers, but he, uh, he never was shy about asking them, and I, I think that's really important. Tell me about a habit that you have that makes you successful in your day-to-day farm. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I think that inquisitive nature uh, and, like, constantly want to learn new things. I mean, I think sometimes that could be a negative, too, is that you, you kind of are always looking for a different iteration of what you're doing to be better at it. Um, and, I, you know, uh, I really feel like, um, you know, that's that's an important um, habit I have of just always asking questions and, and doing that and, and just being looking at other industries and like seeing what can be applied to what we do um, and not being afraid of, you know, that, that cross pollination between different kinds of businesses. Um, I love asking people who do different things, how they do, how they run their business. Cause it's just so um, informative and kind of put, puts you in a lot of different directions. So asking questions of people who aren't even, who might own a factory somewhere, I think are really important. Um, yeah, I like I like the 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 trend there that you're you're establishing, which is, you know, question everything. Um, yeah, it's a really great <laughs> way to learn. I mean, um, I, I love it. Um, Got me in a lot of trouble in college and yeah. other places too, but you know, it's all right. <laughs> um, so, can you recommend a book or a resource that you know listeners might might want to check out that, that you recommend? Yeah, I mean, my book of my farmer book of the year right now, uh, if I could give it a farmer book of the year award, is the Lean Farming Lean Farming by uh, I can't remember I'm liking on his name, uh, but um, it, it is a, a great book. It's about lean, you know, it takes lean manufacturing kind of ideas and, uh, and it's bit by Ben Hartman and it's um, and kind of applies them to agriculture and he, he talks mostly about vegetable based agriculture, but um, I think, you know, the ideas of lean 
with a, a, an ethic towards raising animals in a humane and a, and a healthy way is, is um, it's great. And if think about how our businesses can eliminate, serve our customers better, eliminate waste, um, make more time for ourselves um, to, to enjoy our lives and our family and friends. I mean, those, those are the things we all want. And uh, I think sometimes we, we, we love the suffering a little bit too much the uh, farmers we love being you know working 26 hours instead of 24 i, I don't know but right so um uh so i think that lean farming is really like not i'm not saying we've done it here but we we're constantly uh, my livestock manager and myself are all constantly thinking how can we do that better how can we like do that faster what's the what's the element where we're 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 can lean it down a little bit so that's my my book of the of the year it's a great book and you can definitely apply it to what we all do Great. Um, so we're going to, I got one more for you here and it's a little bit of a challenge for you. Okay. Um, so let's just pretend <laughs> that I plopped you down on a farm tomorrow and I gave you $500. That's all you had. Yep. You're, you still have the same experience, the same knowledge that you have right now, <laughs> but you're starting yep. from scratch, from zip, nothing. Um, describe yep. how you take your $500 and turn it into a profitable pasture poultry business. Uh, well, I mean, I think, you know, again, I think I would find uh, a couple couple com- people in the community who are ordering chickens and make sure we order a lot of them so we can get them cheaper. Uh, that would be, you know, if we're doing a broiler operation, build a build a good shelter. We can do that for pretty inexpensive with some recycled materials. Um, find a nice vegetable CSA kind of in the area that where people are craving some local chicken and partner up with them to get some pre buys to help you afford your grain and everything else. Hope to. Hope to goodness the farm you plot me in has a processor pretty close. Um, maybe drop me next to Grady or someone who has a good processing facility so it's, it's affordable. Um, and then I think I think you can, you know, there's, there's a way to definitely be profitable and with 500 bucks if you kind of use the community around you to, to build those relationships. I think um, you can, you can you know, take that money and, and, uh, and, and do pretty well as long as you're, um, as long as you have a pick, you have to have a pickup truck with that $500, I think. I think you have to get allow a pickup truck even a used one maybe <laughs> so but uh but yeah so I, I think that would be my my kind of inclination to build those relationships with local folks and and build a simple shelter and and make some money and turn it back into your farm and keep and keep your day job too <laughs> great yeah thank you thank you for that um <laughs> so all right so that's all i got pat um one last thing you know where can we where can we find out more about Pat, Pat's pasture? If we if we have questions, if somebody's listening to this and they need some chicken and they're in the New England states, <laughs> where where, uh, where can they? Yeah, go? well, yeah. I mean, we have a website, pastpasture dot com. Um, we're on face Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all the social media. Our uh, our website is is not the best. It still has sheep on it. We don't have sheep anymore. Pictures of sheep on it, but we don't have sheep anymore. But um, it, the information is up to date for the most part. But our social media is probably the best way to get in touch with us um, through through that or through email. And uh, I guess with that, we're going to end it. Thank you so much, Pat, for, for taking part in this and um, spending half an hour with us, almost exactly. And we'll link. <laughs> Perfect. We'll link uh, Pat's pastured and and social media feed facebook on on the uh, show notes so people can can go there and check out great thanks so much mike it was great great chat with you hey that'll wrap us for this episode thanks for listening don't forget to check us out on the web our home is at pasturedpoultrytalk.com pasturedpoultrytalk.com never miss another episode again go there find out how till next time thank you